Part of the reason many serial killers are able to get away with their crimes is that they are unknown by police, don't stand out physically, and can easily blend into a crowd. This would not be the case for Edmund Kemper, the co-ed killer, a behemoth of a man coming in at a height of 6 feet 9 inches and having a murder record before the age of 18. Kemper also had the IQ of a genius and the disposition of a gentle giant, allowing him to trick both police and mental health professionals into believing that he wouldn't hurt a fly, only to go on a killing spree that would cost the lives of seven women and eventually his own mother. Edmund Emil Kemper III was born to Clarnell Kemper and Edmund Kemper II on December 18, 1948 in Burbank, California. Before returning home to work as an electrician, Edmund's father served in World War II and even tested nuclear weapons. His wife would frequently complain about his job as an electrician and he would later say of her, suicide missions and the atomic bomb testings were nothing compared to living with Clarnell. Despite his mother's constant nagging and deprecation of his father, Edmund would grow up to idolize his dad and have a close relationship with him. The Kempers kept small animals such as chickens on the property for food, like many families at the time, and Edmund grew up to have a strong attachment to the animals, naming them and playing games with them. He did have similarly aged siblings, two sisters, one older and one younger. However, his relationship with them was strained by the fact that their mother clearly favored the two girls. Not only this, but on two different occasions, Edmund's older sister Susan put him in a near-death experience. Once when she tried to push him in front of a train, and then again when she pushed him into the deep end of a pool and he nearly drowned. While still at an impressionable age, Edmund saw his father cut the heads off the chickens he had grown so attached to. Later that night, his mother cooked the chickens, and when Edmund refused to eat the animals he saw as pets, his parents both screamed at him and forced him to eat it. His father repeatedly exposed him to animal killings until Edmund eventually got used to it and accepted it as part of the cycle of nature. He got so used to it, in fact, that he would later bury a family cat alive and kill another pet when he suspected it was favoring one of his sisters, and even kept pieces of that cat in his closet until it was discovered by his mother. Edmund would later express that he didn't understand why no one had any issue with the murder of farm animals, but balked at the idea of killing a cat or a dog. In 1957, when Edmund was just under 10 years old, his parents got a divorce, and he was sent to live with his mother and sisters in Helena, Montana, far from his father, who would end up staying in Los Angeles, California. The divorce only worsened Clarnell's favoritism of the girls, and she would frequently belittle and humiliate Edmund for simply being male often stating that all men were worthless. By the time Edmund was 14, he was already 6 foot 4 inches, and his mother would force him to sleep in the basement while she and her sisters slept upstairs. In Edmund's mind, this was her and his sisters going to heaven and him going to hell. The abuse from his mother would continue to escalate as he got older, and she would become more of a degenerate and neurotic alcoholic. Eventually, it got so bad that Edmund ran away from home and went to live with his father who Edmund discovered had remarried and now had a new stepson. This arrangement would only last for around a month, as Edmund's father sent him away to live with his grandparents up in North Fork, California, on their isolated mountain ranch. Unfortunately, the living situation with Edmund's grandparents wasn't much better, as his grandmother was just as abusive and cruel as his mother, and his grandfather had dementia. For a brief period, Edmund returned home to visit his mother, and the visit did nothing but harm his mental health, which he had managed to improve while living with his grandparents. The stay with his mother made Edmund feel delusional, and he began having fantasies surrounding death and murder. He returned home in this semi-delusional state, and on August 27, 1964, at only 15 years old, he got into an argument with his grandmother. In a fit of rage, and unable to fully tell the difference between reality and imagination, Edmund stormed off and grabbed a rifle that he had been gifted for his birthday. Using this rifle, he shot his grandmother in the back of the head before shooting her two more times, this time in the back, and according to some reports, then went and stabbed her twice in the back with a kitchen knife. Edmund then went and fatally shot his grandfather as well, later stating that he didn't want his grandfather to go through the pain of knowing his wife had been murdered. Years later, a psychiatrist named Donald Lund would state that these murders were Edmund's way of avenging the rejection of both his father and his mother. Edmund called his mother after the crimes and told her what he did, and she urged him to call the police and turn himself in, and Edmund followed her instructions to the letter. After being picked up and questioned on his motives by authorities, 
Edmund stated, I just wanted to see what it felt like to kill Grandma. Obviously, Edmund was still a minor at the time of these murders, and instead of being sent away for life at prison, he was instead sent to the Atascadero State Hospital in the hopes that he might still be able to have a bright future. While there, Edmund was diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic, and several tests showed that he had the IQ of a genius, coming in at a stunning 145. Shockingly, Edmund truly enjoyed his life while at the state hospital, as it not only provided him with a rigid and organized schedule that he was glad to adhere to, but it also was genuinely helping his mental health and healing his mind. He was a model patient and was so well behaved and trusted by the authorities that he was even trained and given the responsibility of administering certain psychiatric tests and evaluations to other patients. During his therapy at the hospital, he told his doctors about the abuse he had suffered at the hands of his mother and begged them that upon his release, they wouldn't send him back to her. The doctors also realized the downward spiral Edmund's mental health would take if he was exposed to his mother again. But after four years in the hospital, when it was finally time for Edmund to be released, the doctors did not get the final say. Instead, a judge was given that responsibility, and he once again sent Edmund back into the arms of the woman who had slowly driven him to kill in the first place. Edmund set out to become a cop after leaving the state hospital, hoping to regain some of the organization and rigidity he had lost by being forced back into his mother's custody. However, he was rejected due to his height and settled for the California Highway Department. Despite not being able to become a cop, he still frequented a bar called the Jury Room and made good friends with much of the local police force. Edmund drove in order to spend time out of his mother's house and eventually got into the habit of picking up hitchhikers. While picking up these hitchhikers, who were often young college students, he began to get that itch to kill again, and eventually began to view the hitchhikers as practice for when he would start killing again. Edmund successfully picked up and dropped off 150 students, both male and female, in order to learn what would make a person trust him, how to secretly lock someone in his car without them noticing, and how to discreetly change directions without the passenger realizing it. Edmund began murdering again on May 7, 1972, when he picked up 18-year-old Mary Ann Pesh and Anita Luchessa. He drove the girls to a secluded area, strangled and stabbed the poor girls to death, and then had sexual intercourse with their corpses before dismembering them and disposing of the bodies in a ravine. While storing the dismembered bodies in his car to take to a disposal site, Edmund was actually pulled over by a cop to inform him that his taillight was out. However, Edmund managed to remain calm and collected as to not alert the officer to the two dead bodies in his trunk. The bodies would not be discovered until August of that year. Nearly four full months later, on September 14th, Edmund killed 15-year-old Aiko Ku in a similar fashion, except this time he took the body home before dismembering her and disposing of her. He proceeded to do this to three more women, all college students, and even went so far as to bury one of them in the front yard of his mother's house with the girl's head looking straight up at his mother's window. Edmund realized that the anger and rage he felt towards his mother was the source for his murderous urges, and he decided that he would deal with his urges at the source. On April 20th, 1973, Edmund killed his mother while she slept by bludgeoning her with a claw hammer and slitting her throat with a penknife. He then decapitated his mother, engaged in sexual acts with her head, used it as a dartboard, and screamed at it for hours. Eventually, he invited over his mother's best friend under the guise of watching a movie, strangled her and shoved her in a closet, hoping to use her death as a cover story for his mother's, claiming the two had simply gone on vacation together. Edmund left a note for the police and fled the scene. Eventually, Edmund's guilt got the better of him, and while hiding out in Pueblo, Colorado, he called the police and confessed all the murders. Originally, the police didn't take him seriously, forcing Edmund to call again and request to speak with an officer whom he knew personally. He was later questioned as to why he turned himself in again, and he responded that the original purpose was gone. Emotionally, he couldn't handle it. The trial of Edmund Kemper lasted from October 23rd to November 8th, and he was found sane and guilty on eight counts of first-degree murder and sentenced to seven years to life for each charge, which he is still serving to this day. Edmund Kemper is a very outspoken person, taking as many interviews as he can in an attempt to help other would-be killers get help before they begin committing crimes. However, no matter how much good he does while in prison, it's hard to look past the atrocities he enacted on helpless and completely innocent college students, even if he really has changed. Tell us your thoughts about the case down below, and if you enjoyed the video, consider liking and subscribing so you can see more videos like this, and we'll see you in the next one.